Um, hello, everybody, and good evening. My name is Lisa All, and I'm the manager of audience programs and archives here at Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. Thank you all for joining us tonight for Director's Cut, a pre-performance educational program about PBT's open air production this weekend. We're here with Susan Jaffe, our new artistic director, and with dancers Marissa Grawalski, Alejandro Diaz, Chris Garcia Campos, and Jonathan Bright. We want to welcome them all as well for thank them for being here tonight. Um, the performance this weekend will take place right outside our studios, outside in the parking lot. Um, and it has been a long time coming, this production and these performances. And everyone at PBT is absolutely thrilled that our dancers are able to once again dance on a stage, perform on a stage for a live audience. Extremely excited about um, what's going to be happening this weekend. So let's get some individual introductions from our panel here. Um, and just a note to um, our audience that we are going to be adding accessibility descriptions this year to all of our educational programs. And it's just um, a brief description of ourselves for accessibility purposes. Um, so again, I'm Lisa All, and I'm manager of audience programs. And I'm a white female, um, I have glasses, long uh, kind of salt and pepper hair, more salty these days, and a black shirt. And um, let's go maybe to Jonathan and Chris. Hi, my name is Jonathan Bright. I am a white male, I have red hair, and I'm wearing a white floral shirt. Hi everyone, and my name is Chris. No, just going to say, let's everybody say, sorry, Chris, um, to say how long you all have been with PBT, how long you've been dancing. Uh, this is my third season within the company of Pittsburgh Valley Theater. I have been in the school for five years prior to that, and I've been dancing since I was 16 years old. Um, my name is Cristian Garcia Campos. I am a Latin female. Uh, I'm wearing a white shirt as well. I've been in the company for three years as well. I was in the graduate program before for two, and I'm really excited to be here with everyone. Great. Uh, Alejandro and Marissa. Um, my name is Marisa Grawalski. Um, I'm a white female, and I have almost jet black, really, really long hair. Um, I've been with the company for about Six seasons, I think. <laughs> yeah. My name is Alejandro Diaz, and I am a Hispanic male. And I am about six foot four, and I have long hair, not quite as long as my <laughs> wife, but uh, almost. And <laughs> I've been in the company now for about 12 years. So I feel very privileged to be able to say that, honestly. <laughs> And Susan. My name is Susan Jaffe. I am a white female. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am wearing a blue shirt, even though it looks black right now. And I have been with this company for exactly two months and nine days, um, precisely. <laughs> Um, I just literally moved into Pittsburgh two months and nine days ago uh, and very happy to be here. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. Um, and just a note for our audience members, um, we'd love to have your questions at the end of the program. You can just put them in the chat. There should be a little bubble at the bottom of your screen. You can just type a question into the chat and we will um, uh, ask our panelists at the end of the program. The program will be a total of about 30 minutes and we'll have about uh, five or 10 minutes for questions at the end. So just want to get things started with our conversation. I want to start with Susan um, and just want to see if you can talk a little bit about how this program came together, both logistically, because I you know that was 
a bit of a challenge, and artistically, um, kind of what we'll be seeing on stage and kind of the thinking behind the selection of the pieces. Well, uh, it all started when our executive director, Harris Ferris, had this idea, I think it started in April, about, about purchasing a large mobile stage and that we could, during COVID-19, actually perform outside because it's safer to be outside. And so he fundraised for this stage uh, through foundations and grants. And it's literally sitting in our parking lot right now. Um, but we weren't 100% sure we were actually going to have this stage right now. We were going to perform on a smaller stage. So we're really grateful to have. It is such a beautiful stage. It's huge. Um, and we put our dance floor on top of that. So it's really dancer friendly, uh, a good, good for dancers. So they have a resilient floor. Um, but uh, so we were going to have these performances near Labor Day, uh, whether it was on the smaller stage or the larger stage. And when I arrived, uh, the first thing that we, in fact, I was onboarding with the company for about three months before I got here. So um, I was still working as the dean and I was coming into many meetings uh, on Zoom uh, for, for PBT. And the biggest conversation was, how are we going to get people back into the studios and the offices safely? And that conversation lasted over three months initially. Um, and then, you know, really coming down to, and it took us a long time to sort of sort through, how do you do this? Because this generation, we've never been through a pandemic before. So, um, so figuring out how to get the dancers back safely. And um, luckily, I think <laughs> I am probably one of the most squeamish COVID-19 people that I know. So the, the rules are very stringent uh, here in the studios, but I think that was one of the, the factors that actually helped the dancers come back and be safe. Like for example, for a dancer, you cannot be six feet apart. You have to be at least 12 feet apart because uh, the 12 feet covers like if you have a percussive cough. Now dancers are breathing very, very hard. And even when they have a mask, they're still, you know, there's still more air coming out of a, a dancer than coming out of a regular person. So we put uh, masking tape around uh, 12 foot squares in each of the studios. So I think we have something like 10 or 12 places in the studio that each has their own square for a dancer to be in the middle of that and they don't they don't cross over it so this is this is the very beginning of covid um bringing people back um and then we decided to make very small cohorts so uh i think we started with five people dancers five people in the studio in these very very large studios and then so two cohorts here and one cohort at home. And we, we rotated like that until we started to, when dancers came back, they started to realize, okay, I'm really safe if I just stick to the rules. If I just use the hand sanitizer, wash my hands, use the hand wipes to open doors, you know, make sure that the floors are washed, you know, if we're doing anything that um, requires floor work. So we, it, it has been, a, it's a lot of work. And also we worked with engineers and medical doctors to find out exactly how long it takes for our air to exchange and therefore not mix cohorts um, who are in the studio. So we have a 45 minute cleaning in between each rehearsal. So cleaning of the studios and cleaning of the air so that the next group can come in and be completely in a clean studio. So it's been a lot of, you know, heavy work on the part of ourselves on the part of the dancers to be back here safely. So to get off of all those, you know, uh, tedious tasks that we've had to do to get back here. Uh, so to envision the performance and luckily 
we have many dancers in the company who are couples and or are cohabitating and or have been in a pod during this entire pandemic. And so I was able to put, I believe, seven couples together to create a program. So we, um, so we have actually a really beautiful program. I wanted to do a mixture of classical and contemporary work and George Balanchine. So what we did was um, we started with uh, actually one of my pieces, uh, Carmina Terra, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, which is just a beautiful little five minute piece that actually both couples that we're, we're, we're looking at today will be dancing it and they do it very differently and very beautifully. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing both. And we actually have another couple as well. And then I just, you know, because we've been out of, people have not seen the arts live in so long. And so I wanted to have something lively, something uplifting. So we were doing George Balanchine's Who Cares with George Gershwin's music. So we're doing one of the pas de deux and two solos. So two soloists who are not cohabitating uh, will be doing um, two of those Gershwin solos. And then one of the um, signature pieces of a ballerina is The Dying Swan. It's about four minutes long. She never, she does a step that shimmers across the floor with her feet. It's called a bourree. And um, it's, it's a very, very famous piece. Many of the famous ballerinas have danced this over and over again. And then we have two separate, in two separate programs, we have one, Para de Lasha La Spina, who was, which was choreographed by Sasha James, who I met when I was living in Winston, he is the resident choreographer of Charlotte Ballet. And I saw his work and I, I fell madly in love with it. And I had him come to UNCSA. And he actually set Lasha Laspina on uh, UNCSA students. Uh, but it's really hard, which um, uh, th that couple is not here. But basically, the female does not stop does not, she never touches the floor. And then the other one is Ave Maria by Dwight Roden. And we've done that before. And we do have one of our couples here that is doing Ave Maria. That's um, Marisa and Ale, Alejandro. And uh, they, I would love to hear from them a little bit about what that's been like to work with Dwight um, on that. And then lastly, we have Coppelia uh, on the program. So we have a, a mixture of classic and contemporary work. And they're 40, 45 minute programs so that people can come move in and move out and not worry about co-mingling inside buildings or uh, anything like that. So I think it's a COVID friendly kind of a program. Uh, so that's, uh, that was my longish in introduction, <laughs> but I really would like to hear from Alejandro and Marisa uh, about um, Ave Maria. Why don't you say something? <laughs> um, I performed Ave Maria about, was it, about three or four years ago, the first time. And, um, that was sort of my first introduction into very hard pas de deux work. Um, and so being very young and um, it's actually a very hard piece. <laughs> um, and I kind of realized and learned that the piece was about, it was like having an experience. Um, it was a thought or um, an expression kind of in a dance. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's really well said. Um, it's working with Dwight has been a privilege and we've, we've been able to do that over zoom. Um, he's been able to pop in on some of our rehearsals and I, I would say that having his input really gives the putta a story and he puts it in a context that's just stunning. He talks about um, it being quite spiritual and religious in many ways. And, uh, and he actually talks a lot about how it's actually misleading uh, because people want to perform it as an adagio, but it's quite intense and very exact and very sharp, uh, which 
us being very tall and long, it's quite hard for us to do. So it's, it's been a, a wonderful opportunity to come back and work on this Parada together and uh, get it to the stage for our open air series. Uh, Susan knows that it's been a bit of a challenge. We've been talking about it, but we've been working hard and, and we're looking forward to presenting it to our community and to our patrons that are coming. Um, a quick question I have about Ave Maria is that it is always an audience favorite. The audience loves it um, and audiences all over the country love it. What do you guys think it is about this ballet that so connects with people that, um, you know, just resonates with people? It's emotional for people. What do you think it is about it? Um, I think some of the partnering and the elements in it are very human. And it's not always about being perfect or light as air. Actually, it's quite grounded and sometimes harsh and then sometimes just so beautiful. So I think, I think they can relate to it as well, being. Yeah, there's this duality that's happening within the piece at all times. And um, the male figure is that rock. It's the stability of the piece. It's what allows the female role to crumble and to decay while there's always something there to lift that person up. And so there's, there's this whole uh, feeling of some type of faith in a way. And um, I... I it, it brings it out in me, and I, I don't know how else to explain it other than, like she said, it's an emotion. It's, it's a thought, it's a feeling. And when it comes out, it's, um, yeah, I think it's felt in the audience. So. I went actually very um, quickly about Dwight. Uh, he describes this as a, an allegro, actually. So it's not an adagio. He really, so it's very percussive, even though you've got this beautiful operatic voice singing this very deep and religious kind of, uh, of a song and devoted, I mean, devotional song. Sorry, it's not necessarily religious, but a devotional song um, while you have these very percussive movements and and stunning imagery. So he he Dwight has hits the the bodies in space in these amazing positions uh, right at the right moments. And so I think in that way it's very visceral. It's very powerful as well. And how about Carmina Terra? This is our first Susan Jaffe work I think in the PBT repertory, and that's very exciting. Um, what was kind of the creative process behind that, Susan? I think I've told this story over and over again, right? Jonathan, Chris, do you wanna, would you like to share with our audience the story of Carmina? Uh, yes, so Carmina Terra actually means song of the earth. And it's a very grounded piece. And Susan just explained it to us as um, the bodies of like a galaxy and everything's in spiral. Um, and you really be able to see that as you watch the piece progress. Um, you'll have to remind me, I'm so sorry, the composer's name. Bruno. Yes, it's hard to pronounce. His uh, name is Bruno Luchuarn. And I worked, I did two pieces with him. And this was his last piece with me. He passed away. And he was dying when he composed this piece. And uh, so it's very, it has a lot of transcendence uh, in, the, in the, the feeling of the music. It's almost like he, we didn't know he was not gonna survive. We thought he was gonna survive. Uh, but there was just a sort of this premonition on his part was just sort of transcending into another realm, another dimension. And um, just the other day, I have this one section where she's like this and she falls back into his arms pretty low. I mean, it's a big catch, gentlemen, correct? It's a <laughs> very big catch. And it just occurred to me just the other day that 
that must have been my premonition as well, because it's almost like a death. You know, she falls back like a death, you know, with the Dijel deaf arms. And I did not intend it to, to, to be that, but I just looked at it the other day and I said, oh my gosh, this might have been also some sort of premonition. So, um, but I'd love to hear from them what that was like to, you know, I think I like to work on it where you don't just teach the steps and then you learn how to do the steps because they were all in spiral um, and what that was like for them. Uh, I know it was kind of slow going, but. Uh... Yeah, well, uh, I think it was definitely a process. I remember at the beginning, um, Susan, and, and I mean, still, I'm still working on it, but like just like relaxing a lot the neck because of all the spirals, especially. It's a lot of like letting the torso go and like move around to create that effect. And yeah, I think that sometimes we're used to learning the whole thing fast and then trying to work on the steps separately. And it was, I think it was really helpful to go like to learn it, but then get the movement right. So we didn't have to like backtrack and go do it again. And that way it was kind of like we were done with it and we put it apart and we just kept going. And so we didn't have to like really, really work on the details because we worked on them before. And yeah, I think it was a huge change from the beginning big. to now, hopefully. But uh, it was really fun. I think there's a lot of like intricate moments, but it's really nice once you get it right. It also helped from the beginning that we, when we were learning it, that you already have those corrections to start from the beginning. It, it helps you to build and build and build each time rather than having to go backwards and almost start from the beginning because you're like, oh, this step. But, you know, it was really nice to have this kind of a learning experience. It was, it was mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. Great. Ali and Marisa. I'll, I'll say right off the bat that counting the music has been one of the most difficult parts of <laughs> of the piece but but to but to add to that it it really does create uh, that transcendence and that feeling of being in another space um, and I, I would like to also say that it was wonderful having Jonathan and Christian in rehearsals with us as well as um, Josiah and Aaron because I think it we all helped each other understand the movement um, because it is so uh, right it's very twisty and, and spirally as a partner right Jonathan I think understanding how to help the girl achieve those really beautiful long lines while still spiraling all the time I think um, yeah it was an incredible experience just to be in the studio again but also with some of our colleagues which hasn't happened in such a long time is it's really nice to be able to pick your brains and like bat ideas off of each other in that kind of a you know yeah i think it's it's like interesting seeing what everybody did to make it work and so i'd be like oh i'm gonna take that so it was like it was really nice having everyone around for sure i was just excited to be lifted around the way <laughs> <laughs> so much <laughs> I was like, oh, we're going to do this shape now. And I think there were so many beautiful lifts, actually. I've never done, actually, I don't think any of these lifts before. Um, I don't think so. So that was exciting. Get to finally learn how to do all this, like, very difficult, but very beautiful pas de deux work, which has always been sort of a dream, so. Well, they all dance it beautifully, as I said, very differently, but beautifully. But also it was really good for me to have all the couples, you know, uh, not all of them in the room at once, but some couples in the room, uh, because it was a lot easier for me. Um, so if Jonathan was having trouble, I would say, Ali, what are you doing? And if Ali was having trouble, I would say, Jonathan, what are you doing? Or Marisa, what are you doing? And Chris, what are you doing? And so it, it really it helped a lot, actually. It was really good. So, uh, yeah. And what about who cares? Just a little bit about um, that pas de deux and um, 
what the music is and what you all think of that and how you deal with a Balanchine ballet. Yeah, it's really specific. They're very, very detail oriented. And then they turn it into fun. And it's, it, I don't know, for me, it's, it's so strict when you first learn it and there's a technique behind it and then everything has a reason for being, but then they almost like put the cherry on top at the end and they're like, have fun, look at each other in the eyes, which was one of my, one of my hard, hard things to do was actually look at her. I just like, almost, you know, look through her because you're thinking of the steps, but as you build and build and, and they, they break you out of that box that you put yourself in, it's just, it turns into so much fun. And then you have Ger George Gershwin's music and it's just, oh, it's so much fun now that you let, I've let go at least. I, I agree with that as well, especially since I feel it's like such a different part from Carmina Terra. So it's like switching completely while, while I'm doing it because this one has that kind of like jazzy movement and it's almost in my head a little bit more human like movement because we can add a little bit of your own like groove to it almost. And so it's like thinking that I can move and Susan told us this, like, because she was giving us a little bit of advice for it. It's like almost not worrying too much about, like, the shape of the arms. It's like, and even in the videos that you see, everyone's more like, I'm not throwing them around, but it's more free instead of having to, like, reach a pose. And obviously, you still have to have technique, nothing. But it's just a little bit more loose and definitely a lot of fun. I think it was really funny the first time that we ran it and we took our masks off because this one is more like connecting with each other. And so it was like, oh, there's a face right there. <laughs> so it was just like, it was funny, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. And there's a lot of rhythm in this. Tell us about how Think of that rhythm. was hard, huh? <laughs> yes, very hard. I will attest to that. I, I had a lot of trouble hearing the syncopated rhythms, but now that now that they're sort of in our bodies, I, I can't hear it any other way now. It's so strange because at first you only hear it the one way. And then now that they've not drilled it into me, but it, they've taught me the what is the appropriate way to hear it. I can't hear it any other way now. I'm like, how did I ever get it wrong? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. And Susan, maybe just a little bit about Coppelia before we go. Just um. Um, so Coppelia is, this is the third act Parada. So um, this is a story about a couple, a young man who uh, is very flirtatious with all the girls in the village. And uh, his fiance actually is a very strong and, and um, uh, strong and sassy woman. And um, the young man, falls in love with a doll who is the, the doll of Dr. Coppelius, who's right next door. And he puts uh, his doll out on the porch, on the balcony, and she's reading. And, and um, uh, he thinks that she's real because she's a, she's a little bit of an automaton. And so he falls in love with her and, um, um, Swanhilda is, of course, very angry that he's fallen in love with somebody else. So she sneaks into Dr. Coppelius's house to find out that it's actually a doll and not a real person. And so she dresses up as the doll. And Coppelius, when he comes home, he thinks that the doll has come alive. He does magic tricks on it or magic on it and thinks the doll has come alive. Franz walks into the house and um, he uh, wants to meet the woman, but it actually is Swan Hilda in the doll's costume. And she plays along with that. Anyway, at the very end, uh, she fi he finds out that it's actually Swan Hilda and all is forgiven and they get married at the end. And this is their marriage parada. And it's, it's very sweet. It's also very exacting and very hard, um, uh, but just a, just a beautiful, and if you see the whole ballet, uh, 
all the music to Coppelia is amazing, uh, especially the famous Mazurka. Um, but it's it's a gorgeous, very exacting pas de deux, um, and they're dancing it very well. So we're excited to see it. Oh, well, wonderful. Well, um, just cannot wait for this weekend. It feels like it has been forever since we've seen you guys, <laughs> and um, certainly since we've seen you on stage. And I know everybody is really excited. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks to our audience for being here. And we hope that we will see everybody um, in the parking lot <laughs> this coming weekend. All right, thanks everybody so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.